Some of you are sitting in the West and thinking, what can I do? I'm not there. I want to be a hero for Israel. To be a hero for Israel is to come to Israel and live here and make your life here and hopefully live here. Here's one person who did just that. His name, Michael Levin. Michael Levin was born in Philadelphia. He made Aliyah to Israel in 2003. He joined the Israeli paratroops, fulfilling a personal dream of his. And when the war broke out, and he was in the States, and he heard about the war, he rushed back to Israel to rejoin fellow soldiers of his in battle when Israel was attacked. He fell in battle against the Hezbollah terrorists on August 1st, 2006. You can't fulfill your dreams unless you dare risk it all. Michael Levin grew up like most American Jewish kids, born on February 17, 1984, and raised in Philadelphia. He graduated from Council Rock High School in 2002. Michael's maternal grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust and passed on to him a legacy of pride and strength in his Jewish heritage. As a teenager, Michael was active in the Hagesher region of United Synagogue Youth and attended Camp Ramah in the Poconos. He loved sports and was an avid fan of Philly teams, especially the Philadelphia Phillies. In February 2001, Michael came to Israel for two months to study the 4,000-year history of the Jewish people at the Alexander Muss High School in Israel. While in Israel, Michael expressed his desire to make Aliyah, move to Israel, and become an Israeli citizen, and serve in Sahal, in the army, in the Israel Defense Forces. Michael proved to be an outstanding student and was especially moved by the stories of Jewish heroes like Judah the Maccabee, Yehuda HaMaccabee, Shimon Bar Kochba, Rabbi Akiva, Hannah Senesh, Eli Cohen, Avigdor Kahalani, and Yonatan Yoni Netanyahu. The most moving moment for Michael in school here, was on the last day of the program when his class visited the grave of Yoni Netanyahu, who was the hero of the 1976 Entebbe rescue mission. His grave was at Mount Herzl in Jerusalem. Yoni Netanyahu is the older brother of the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Michael looked up to Yoni as a role model and a hero and was touched by Yoni's words from a 1975 letter. He wrote, By past, I mean not only my own past, but the way in which I see myself as an integral part, a link in the chain of our existence and Israel's independence, unquote. Like Yoni, Michael also saw himself as a link in the chain of Jewish history and felt an obligation to defend his people. He dreamed of serving in the Israeli Defense Forces. After graduating high school, Michael attended Nativ, USY's year-long course in Israel, and in his Nativ yearbook wrote the words that would become his motto, quote, you can't fulfill your dreams unless you dare risk it all. Michael was neither a daredevil nor a gambling man. He was a sweet, funny, humble, kind, loving human being who relished life and lived it to the fullest.
He simply believed that life wasn't worth living unless there was some ideal you loved so much that you'd be willing to sacrifice your life for it. For Michael, that ideal was Israel. In 2003, Michael made Aliyah to Israel and began studying Hebrew at an ulpan, an intensive course in speaking Hebrew, on Kibbutz Yavna. Like all Israelis, Michael was drafted into the Israeli Defense Forces and reported to the Army Induction Center at Tel HaShomer. As he was being processed, the officer in charge noticed his papers had not been finalized due to his new status in the country. The officer told him that he couldn't be drafted at this time. Undeterred, Michael went outside the Army Induction Center and climbed up a trash dumpster, sneaking into the second floor of the building. When the officer discovered him, he hollered at Michael and said, No one can get through the front door here without papers! To which Michael smiled and replied, What makes you think I came through the front door? The officer pulled some strings and arranged for Michael to be processed. As an Israeli soldier... He later remarked, I've been here at the Army Induction Center for 20 years. Some kids don't want to be here and look for ways to get out. But Michael was the first kid I ever met who broke in to be inducted into Tzahal, the IDF. Once in Tzahal, Michael volunteered for the IDF's finest combat unit, the Red Beret Paratroopers. During his basic training, Michael learned to parachute. Small in size, five foot six, and weighing only 118 pounds, Michael was blown off course on his first jump. Afterwards, his officers had to tie weights to his parachute to keep him from drifting. Despite his small size, Mike was a fierce fighter with a lion's heart. At the end of their basic training, the paratroopers go on a 90-kilometer or 55-mile march to Jerusalem where they receive their Red Berets at Ammunition Hill, a famous battle site for the 1967 Six-Day War. In 2001, while still at school, Michael had learned about the heroism of the paratroops in, the, in that battle from one of the surviving veterans who spoke to his class. Now he was receiving his red beret on that hallowed ground. Michael described that day as one of the happiest in his life. Mike was not only a brave soldier, but he remained a loving son and brother. He once said, quote, I'm not worried about dying. I'm just worried about what it would do to my family. Michael held a special status in Sahal called Chayal Boded, given to lone Israeli soldiers whose parents do not live in the country. Military service is tough enough for most young Israelis, but they are comforted knowing that they will soon return home on their Shabbat leaves to a warm and loving family. Michael had none in Israel, making his service that much tougher. Some of Michael's friends back in the States were worried about uh, Michael being in, a, in an elite combat unit of the Israeli army. But Michael responded philosophically to them. He said, quote, I'm doing exactly what I want to do and going exactly where I want to be. And if God should decide to call me home, I'm fine with that. On a visit back to Philadelphia, Michael told his parents that if anything ever happened to him, he wanted to be buried on Mount Herzl in Jerusalem. That's the military cemetery. On July 12, 2006, the Lebanese terrorist organization Hezbollah attacked Israel and kidnapped two Israeli soldiers, Ehud Goldwasser and Eldad Regev. The Hezbollah, dedicated to Israel's destruction and armed by Iran, began shelling Israel's northern cities. Michael heard that his unit was sent into battle, and he promptly told his family that he had to cut his visit short to rejoin his comrades in arms. He rushed back to Israel and rejoined his unit. The 890th Battalion of the Paratroopers Brigade, then fighting inside Lebanon. Michael's unit was on a mission in the Lebanese village of Eta al-Sha'ab, a Hezbollah stronghold. 
when they came under heavy missile and gunfire. Held up in a house, Michael fought bravely, but on August 1, 2006, he was tragically killed by a Hezbollah sniper. His fellow soldier and friend, Shlomi Singer, described Michael's last moments. He said, I heard a round of gunfire and saw Michael lying on his stomach. I knew in my heart he was dead. I lifted him to one of the houses where I tried to revive him, but there was no chance. I said quietly in English, I love you, Michael, and I'm so sorry. He was wearing a big green kippah, and before we went into Lebanon, I put his kippah on my head and said the Shema, praying that we all come back safely. After Michael was killed, we placed his body on a stretcher and carried him for several kilometers between the cliffs and rocks to bring his body to safety. It was the final honor and respect that we could give him. Michael's family was notified in Philadelphia of his death. Michael's family was notified in Philadelphia of his death in battle, and they immediately flew to Israel for his funeral. One of their biggest worries was whether they'd be able to find a minyan, a quorum of ten men necessary for communal prayer, for the ceremony, as they had no family in the country. They arrived at Ben Gurion Airport on August 3, 2006, and drove right from the airport to the National Military Cemetery on Mount Herzl. When the car arrived at the cemetery, the Levins saw thousands of people gathered there. Michael's father was confused by the large crowd and thought there were 10 or 15 other funerals taking place at the same time. The soldiers escorting the family told them that Michael's was the only funeral being held at this time. And all the thousands of people in attendance, most of whom had not known Michael, were there to honor their fallen son. Immersed in their shock and grief, but embraced by a loving and grateful nation. The Levins family buried their son on the hills of Jerusalem, the city he loved with all his heart, just a few yards away from the grave of his hero, Yoni Netanyahu. This Memorial Day, let us remember those who have fallen in service for the Jewish people to protect them in their homeland, Israel. Let us remember the victims of Arab terror who died here only because they were Jews living in their home in Israel. Let us pray for their souls, pray for his family and friends who are left behind and are suffering their loss on this Memorial Day here in Israel. You've been listening to the Tamar Yonah Show. Stories of fallen soldiers on this Memorial Day here in Israel, Yom Hazikaron. I'm reading from a book called A Voice Called Stories of Jewish Heroism by Yossi Katz from Geffen Publishing. In the year 132 of the Common Era, the great Jewish general Shimon Bar Kachva led a three-year revolt for Jewish freedom against the mighty Roman Empire. While the immediate causes of the revolt were the Romans' outlawing of Brit Milah, or circumcision, and their decision to rebuild Jerusalem as a pagan city called Alia Capitolina, perhaps the greatest cause of the revolt was the underlying Jewish desire to be a free people in their own land. General Bar Kokhba was supported by the greatest rabbi in Israel, Rabbi Akiva, whose students became his bravest soldiers. His guerrilla tactics frustrated and outsmarted the Romans. Bar Kokhba liberated Jerusalem and even minted silver coins with a picture of the Jewish temple and the words in Hebrew, Year One for the Freedom of Israel. 
In the end, Rome feared slave nations around the world would be inspired by Bar Kokhba to rise up and fight for their freedom. Emperor Hadrian sent eight Roman legions from around the world, including their best general, Julius Severus, who was born in Britain at the time. The Romans, after three and a half years, eventually crushed the revolt, killing 600,000 Jews, including Bar Kokhba, who died heroically in battle at the last fortress called Betar. Hadrian then outlawed Judaism and tried to annihilate the Jewish people. He renamed Israel Palestine, Latin for Philistines, a people that had disappeared a thousand years earlier. His goal was to make the world forget the Jews ever had a country of their own. The ten leading rabbis in Israel, including Rabbi Akiva, were captured and executed in Caesarea. One rabbi was wrapped up in a Torah scroll and burned at the stake, and Rabbi Akiva was raked over with iron combs. As he was tortured, as they combed the skin off of his body with hot combs, he smiled, and his students, who were forced to watch the execution, cried out in wonder, Rabbi, how do you smile? Rabbi Akiva answered, It is written in the Torah, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. I have always loved God with all my heart and with all my might. But I never knew how to love God with all my soul. Now the Romans think they are killing me, but they are actually helping me carry out the one mitzvah I was unable to follow in my life, to love God with all my soul, even when it is taken from me. Then Akiva, feeling his life slip away, cried out the Shema Yisrael prayer. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Akiva died on the word one. But along with Bar Kokhba, left our people a legacy of courage, strength, and Jewish commitment that would fuel our modern-day struggle for independence in Israel. 2,000 years later, the courage of Bar Kokhba and the spirit of Rabbi Akiva continue to live on in the soldiers of the Israel Defense Forces. On July 12, 2006, the Hezbollah terrorist organization attacked Israel across its northern border, causing the Second Lebanon War. During that campaign, the common Israeli soldiers distinguished themselves with countless acts of bravery and heroism. The most moving story, perhaps, is of Major Roy Klein from the settlement of Eli, who was the deputy battalion commander of the 51st Battalion of the Golani Infantry Brigade. Major Klein grew up in Ranana, but moved to Eli after studying in the Bnei David Yeshiva. He was educated on the ideals and values of love and commitment to Torah, the Jewish people, and the state of Israel. He saw his service in Golani as a fulfillment of his Jewish obligations. He was loved and admired by all his soldiers and was designated for promotion by Tzahal, by the IDF. On July 26, 2006, a day before his 31st birthday, Roy Klein took part with his unit in the fierce fighting in the Hezbollah stronghold of Bint Jabil. As they cleaned out terrorist gun nests in house-to-house -house fighting, a barrage of Hezbollah gunfire and grenades was unleashed on the Golani soldiers. Klein sent his platoon commander, Lieutenant Amichai Merchavia, with several soldiers to outflank the enemy, but they came upon a high, impassable wall next to a courtyard. 
Intense sniper fire and grenades rained down on Merchavia and his men, and Amichai was hit. He called to Klein on the radio for help. Major Klein rushed to Merchavia's aid with several soldiers and a medic. He succeeded in placing the wounded Merchavia on a stretcher when a Hezbollah grenade was thrown at the soldiers assembled in the courtyard. It seemed that they all faced certain death. When their beloved commander, Roe Klein, dived on the live grenade and screamed, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad! Hear, O Israel! The Lord our God, the Lord is one! Klein died in the explosion, but saved the lives of many soldiers with him. He died on the word one, just like his teacher and hero, Rabbi Akiva. Roe Klein was a sensitive, caring soul who was loved by all who knew him. He was a brilliant and outstanding student of engineering and also played the saxophone. He is survived by his young wife, Sarah, and his two sons, Gilad and Yoav. Klein was buried in the National Military Cemetery on Mount Herzl in Jerusalem on July 27, 2006. That day would have been his 31st birthday. In all, eight soldiers died in the Battle of Bint Jabil, including Klein and Merchavia. Posthumously, Roe Klein was awarded the Israel Medal of Valor. As with the Bar Kokhba revolt, Jews in Israel and abroad will debate the merits of the 2006 Second Lebanon War for years to come. There are, of course, many issues that need to be investigated, and lessons must be learned so that we can continue to preserve our freedom in Israel. While our Prime Minister, Defense Minister, and Chief of Staff all earned poor grades for their leadership in the war, the soldiers in the field proved that they are among the finest generations of young Jews in 2,000 years. It would be wise for us to honor the courage of our youth and the memories of our fallen heroes, so that their legacy will never die. From Rabbi Akiva to Roe Klein, it is that very legacy that has been the secret of our survival. <laughs>